Our subject then for this evening is the American dream. And in starting out about it, I want to say that it was, I believe, Risa Stevens who had a very unusual experience while singing at the Met. During this experience, she was transported from the Met, Metropolitan Opera in New York, to what could have been the Roman Colosseum or a Greek amphitheater. Everything faded away from before her gaze, and she was now singing in a past time, a past era. Recently, I think a gentleman by the name of Mr. Jess Stern has published a book on re-embodiment. I forget the exact title. It could be a pair of blue eyes or something like that. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. At least the book deals with what appears to be an authenticated example of re-embodiment. I believe Shakespeare said something about each one of us playing our part on the stage of life in our own time, making our exits and our entrances. When we start to consider the American dream then, we ought not to consider the American dream from the standpoint of a remote era in history. We ought to consider it as a time in which we may have lived. If we were not embodied here in America, defending freedom, we were perhaps in the Caucasians or in Europe or somewhere else upon the planet engaged in a struggle for freedom, a search for liberty and the pursuit of happiness as we understood it. The American dream, however, is quite unique because it is the fruition of a hierarchical act on the part of the great white brotherhood. In order then to bring us up to date on what is behind the American dream, I would like to relate a few of the embodiments of Saint Germain, as he is called. Saint Germain was the prophet Samuel. Perhaps you recall how Hannah told him when he told her about his nocturnal experiences of hearing the voice of God saying, Samuel, Samuel, how that she advised him to say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So the little boy did just that, and he established his rapport with the divine voice which spoke to him as a child. Saint Germain then having established as the prophet Samuel his rapport with God became a great Hebrew prophet. I want to relate this event to our times and to America a little later. I want to go down some more of his embodiments because they do have a part, a link in the American dream. Saint Germain was also Francis Bacon. He was also Joseph, the supposed father of Jesus, the guardian and protector of Mary and Jesus, during the Galilean embodiment. He was the one who taught the infant Jesus carpentry, and thus the carpenter of Nazareth sought to frame a better world 2,000 years ago. Now then, we come to a very interesting facet in the life of Saint Germain. He is embodied at the court of Spain in the time of Isabella, as Christopher Columbus. In setting sail for these shores, in honor of Mary, the mother, he named his chief vessel the Santa Maria. And he emblazoned upon its sails the Maltese cross, 
because he was also a knight of Malta. And I might add, subsequently, a knight of the garter, which is not, although we use the symbol of a blue garter or something, it is really symbolical of the garter and is the knights of the garters, those who guard the high traditions of the grail and of the traditions of knighthood itself. Saint Germain then, who was the prophet Samuel, who was Joseph, who was also embodied in England as the illegitimate son of Queen Elizabeth and the Earl of Leicester, became the Baron of Verulam, Viscount St. Albans, and a host of other titles. The illegitimate son then was highly honored. When certain scandals arose in England, he took the blame for those scandals rather than have them put upon others. This was an act of kindness on his part. He wrote the Shakespearean plays, but more important even than the plays, and they were important, St. Germain wrote the Novum Organum, dealing with a new order of the ages that was to be established here in America. In the book of Revelation, we read a story about a woman that is fascinating. It states, Unto the woman was given the wings of a great eagle, that she should fly into the wilderness, where a place was prepared for her for a time, a time, a time, and a half a time. There she should bring forth her son, who would rule the nations with a rod of iron. It states then that a dragon came forth and cast out of his mouth a flood so that he could destroy the woman and her seed. We see then as the symbol of America the wings of a great eagle. We see this as a wilderness country, as a place that was long prepared and we come now to recognize who is this mythological figure of Uncle Sam. Why, the prophet Samuel, of course. The prophet Samuel, who long ago foresaw the birth of a new Israel on these shores here, who saw the Divine Mother image bringing forth the, the Christ man-child and foresaw the spread of Christian America from one shore to another, foresaw the little cities springing up all over the land until it was dotted with towns and hamlets and homes, who foresaw the growth of this nation from its original concept, because America did not just happen. It was not the result of a ragged little band of religious individuals who were persecuted in England and then fled to America on the Mayflower. Although my ancestors did not come over on the Mayflower, you and I may have just as much pride in this nation under God and its original constitutional founding as though we were there on that boat and signed the Mayflower Compact for ourselves. The American ideal then has roots in the past roots in the past that involve many of us today. Some of us were there, along with Ed Murrow, when he put on his series of I Was There. We may well have walked at Salem. We may have watched when religious bigotry caused the mystical seekers to be burned at the stake because of bigotry and intolerance as witches. One of our late president's wives was there in New England at that time. I will not identify her for you, except to say that she was burned at the stake in New England. Some of you were there during those hard winters. We are not dealing now then with history that is dead history. We're dealing with living history, with living people. Many people now in America were a part of the American dream then. And those people are today 
because of the coal of fire that is within their heart, still interested in the American dream because they know that it was not a case of a persecuted band of religious people coming to this country and forming a new government, a colony, and then seeking to break away from tradition and from England. They came here in hope, it is true, of finding a new way of life. And this is always something that people are looking for. They all have their dreams. We've heard a lot this year about I have a dream. Well, there have been dreams and dreams and dreams. But the American dream today is being exposed to withering forces that seek to destroy it. And many of our young people today have never been exposed to the greatness of that dream because the pages of history, somehow or other, as they are now being written and rehashed and rewritten, do not contain the spirit of 1776. They do not contain the spirit of the original colonists. There is a death then in our land of patriotism. People do not stand up when the flag goes by. Their hearts do not beat to the stirring of martial music. We are now experiencing a situation where people look upon patriotism as identifiable with war. Yet we ask ourselves in all honesty, what was the founding purposes of this country? Was it not to preserve freedom? And if it was to preserve freedom then, we have to consider that the early patriots did not count the cost. They gathered their young around them, they wrapped them in their arms, and the mothers and grandmothers bore arms, and the right to bear arms was a fundamental guarantee of our Constitution. It was put in there in order to give us protection against the forces of tyranny. Now, I think that disarmament is a lovely thing. It could be very much a part of the American dream. I would love to see everyone in the world come to the pile and lay their guns, their armaments, their atomic energy and everything on a great funeral pyre that we could light light up and say, let this funeral pyre light up the whole world with brotherliness and peace and harmony. But I ask myself in all honesty before God, dare I trust the communist nations of this world with the destiny of my country? I ask myself, can I believe their promises? From past experience, have they shown to us those elements of integrity that would allow us to place the hands of our children in the hands of the communist leaders and say, here are my children, take these children, I trust them to you, you will do right by them. If we can say that in all honesty, then I think we are ready to surrender our nation. But I do not believe that we have a dearth of patriots in this land. I believe we have sleeping patriots. I believe many people are not aware because of apathy and because of fear and because of a clouding of the issues of just what is at stake. They identify America with America's greatness from a current level, from militaristic preparedness, from the standpoint of commercial greed in the marks of commerce. But they have little recognition or awareness of just what America really stands for. America is the cradle of liberty, the cradle of democracy. Freedom's child, that is America. And America is intended to preserve freedom, but not freedom and liberty with absolute license, to do what we will to our neighbor. I think it was Theodore Roosevelt who said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Somehow or other, carrying the big stick is very bad, Today, people are often much against the idea of war. I, too, am against war. I think war is a terrible thing. It has scored the whole world over the years. But I ask myself, what are we going to do in the, the current crisis in the world? Are we going to just sit back and say, well, these little boys are just Indians. They're running around here with their tomahawks and their bows and arrows and they may put an arrow in my child or in myself at some time or other, 
and all of that, but I'm going to just go out and love them to death. And that's going to work. Now, I'm not a hawk and I'm not a dove and I refuse to be identified with either side of the fence. But I do believe that people have to stand for something. I don't believe that America is against anything particularly. I don't think America is out here intending to destroy Russia. I believe that Russia could continue to conduct its business under a communist form of government for the next thousand years and the United States would never do anything at all to them as long as they left us alone. I believe that every communist country could rest at peace and never have any need to pile up stockpiles of atom bombs if America were to do as I think she would do. I don't think we are a nation of militarists. I don't think that we have a desire to enslave our neighbor, even economically. While the picture of the ugly American has been scattered abroad as a true portrayal of American business, I choose to think that this may be an example of some businessmen, but certainly not of all. And I think we still have generous-hearted people, warm-hearted people who believe in the free enterprise system, who believe in exporting free enterprise to the world because they think it gives a better deal to the people. And I believe that the American ideal is the best ideal in the world for all countries. But then you see, if the people of Ghana elect to have a democracy as they have done, then it is not an American system of government. It is the Ghanaian system of government. And even Russia could adopt our system of government without in any way having us control their destiny. They would still retain the perfect right over their destiny. And so while there are many fresh winds of change in the offing, and it is now a studied fact that each decade shows changes in our government and in our people, I question very seriously as to whether our young people are being taught in the colleges of our land, in our universities, the true principles of liberty and freedom. It appears to me that there has been a great infiltration into our college system and into our free society of agents that were trained in espionage and in Marxist doctrines, that they are fostering those doctrines in our land while they are flying under the protection of the American eagle. The woman I see as the Divine Mother who loves all children in the world equally The man-child she brought forth is the Christ of every man. The dragon is, of course, the diabolical enemy of all people on earth. The dragon that wants to drag us all down into the mud and mire of constant warfare and struggle. The flood that I see released from the dragon's mouth is propaganda and literature which is designed to subvert the people away from the principles of freedom to destroy the divine man-child to destroy free enterprise and cosmic law, which clearly states that everything that a man does that is good will return to him, that everything that a man does that is evil will return to him. This is the only sensible golden rule law in existence. That law of return, that what you send out into the world will come back to you, is your bond with God, that if you do well, As God himself told Abel, you're going to receive, and as he told Cain too, you're going to receive from God the good that you send out. And if you do evil, you're going to get that back. You cannot change. None of us can change those principles. And so the American dream is very much involved in the principles of America, the principles which we are supposed to live by and upon which we are supposed to stand. There are those that would like to take the money that America has her entire economic structure and divide it all up. And after they divided it all up, say, well, now it's going to work out all right. Everybody's got their share. One man said, yes. He said, that's perfectly all right. He said, let's divide it up on Saturday and give everybody their share. Well, the fellow said, that's all right. He says, by uh, a week later, he says, it'll all be back in the same hands again anyway. So that's okay with me. Yeah, but the fellow says, let's divide it up every Saturday. (laughs) And of course, that is the idea. It's to take away 
from those who have and that which they have worked for and which they have received. Now, some people say, well, they never worked for it. They were born with a gold spoon in their mouth and they've never had to do a tap of work all their life except write a check and practically break their hand uh, holding up a pen to write their checks. All this is true, but you see, those who understand re-embodiment know that when people are born with a gold spoon in their mouth, it's because it comes down to them from the past. They deserve it. There's something in their karmic record that entitles them to have it. Now then, can we legislate that away from people and say we're going to give it to someone else? You can do it by law and you can do it by force, but ultimately it will always come back sooner or later to the ones that deserve it because you cannot cheat the scales of cosmic justice. But this is what communism and many forms of socialism and many of these things are designed to do. They want to promise people the moon and say you can have all of this. This is the American dream. You can have service from the cradle to the grave. We'll assign you a number when you're born and we'll assign you a number when you die and we'll put that on your tombstone. And we'll take care of you all the days of your life. It reminds me of the Psalm of the Chevrolet, which is something like uh, the 23rd Psalm. It goes like this. The Chevy is my auto. I shall not want another. It leadeth me beside the repair shops. It vexeth my soul. Its radiator runneth over. I anoint its tire with patches. It has a breakdown in the presence of mine enemies. And if this thing shall follow me all the days of my life, I shall dwell in the bug house forever. Amen. <laughs> well, that's the way a lot of this is all about. That's what it's all about, is people want something for nothing. This is what's happening in our land today. The American dream has been forgotten. People do not have to draw their own water out of wells that they dug. They do not have to today go out and chop down their own trees and carry their firewood in, that is, unless they live in some parts of the country where they still do these things. But the average American today has his shoes made for him, his shirts made for him, his neckties made for him. Why, they'll even make a noose for him if he commits a crime and see to it that he's hung in some states, although the Supreme Court's trying to do away with that too in their coddling the criminal program. But it's a very interesting thing, what is happening all over the world. I mean, we have this going on right now. People just want and want and want. They desire, but they have no desire to work for what they want. And you and I know that they can't possibly, by cosmic law, fulfill the American dream under that system. Yet the politicians will stand up here and tell these people, they'll say to them, we will give you social security from the cradle to the grave. We're going to give you all this. And they'll raise your taxes every year and they'll raise the cost of living every year until they take the very rug right out from underneath you. They're doing this all the time. And where is the American dream then? It's gone out the window. And people have forgotten it in their desire to grab for something for nothing. I don't think that in all honesty, any of you would feel that this would be the right thing for any of us to expect, that someone should just take care of us. Why, God gave us a body and he gave us a mind and he gave us a creative imagination and he's endowed us with any number of marvelous qualities. And these qualities will win for us in this nation our freedom. They'll enable us to keep this nation strong by working together and cooperating with one another. You can see that, but you see when people are manipulated by the manipulators, they don't see any of this. They just think that that's the way it should be. Let's go back then to the American dream. Let's go back to the early patriots. Let's recognize the involvement that caused men to say, I regret that I have but one life to give for my country. And how about Barbara Fritchie that stuck her head out the window and said, shoot this old gray head if you must, but spare my country's flag. Those people did not stop to think, did they? You see the whole point of it all? I mean, we could have been Barbara Fritchie or we could have been Betsy Ross or we could have been any of these people. 
And I happen to know who Betsy Ross is. She's living right now in Washington, D.C. Isn't that interesting? Reminds me of the party and re-embodiment they had in Chicago where everybody came dressed as they were in their past incarnation and there wasn't a single person in the crowd that wasn't a king or a queen. So, <laughs> you know, well, that's the way it is with some of these things. You know, somebody might imagine they're Barbara Fritchie one time, uh, or Betsy Ross. One time I mentioned somebody and then they come up and they said, now that wasn't the party you mentioned it because I was that person. So if any of you have any ideas about having been one of these historical people, I don't know the answers to everything. I just know the answers to a few things. And uh, it doesn't really make too much difference. The main idea is our involvement in the American dream today. It doesn't matter that our forefathers won their freedom in 1776. It doesn't matter that they settled the Civil War back in 1865 and 1861 and had all those battles. That doesn't matter at all. What matters is that we preserve our country today. Otherwise, we lose the whole context of the American Revolution because the American Revolution is not something that just started back in, at that time and then continued a few years and ended. The American Revolution has been going on ever since. And of course, that's exactly what the communists themselves are trying to sell us, but they want it to go the other way. They don't want it to be in an evolution that we are having today in America. They want it to be a revolution to just overthrow everything that we stand for, everything we love and hold dear, and put in their system of government and their form of tyranny. Now, we don't want the Ogpu or the secret police, or any of these other organizations running our country. We don't believe in a police state. We don't believe in police power, but we recognize police authority is necessary in this country. And we have to have courts and judges. That's all provided for in the Constitution to give justice to our land. I think you can see then how very important it is that we identify with the American dream and try to uphold the principles that made this country great in the beginning because freedom is the greatest gift that we will ever have. And Moria and St. Germain have both told me many times that if we lose this battle for our freedom, that many of the people are going to be very sorry because they will come back into embodiment and find the world with the red flag and the hammer and sickle flying over the earth and they'll have to live under it. You see, some people think, well, I'm 50, I'm 60, I'm 70, I'm 80, and they say, well, I won't have only 5, 10, 15, or 20 more years, and I'll be out of it all. So I don't care what happens then. That's not the idea. If you are a true American and stand for the principles that St. Germain stood for down through the ages, that was the principle of obedience, that he obeyed the voice of God that spoke to him as the little boy Samuel, that had some sense of integrity in his blood and recognized that he was a spiritual being. If you have that faith, it's going to span the years. It doesn't identify with 1933 and the NRA. It doesn't identify with the days of prohibition. It doesn't identify with the Eisenhower administration or with any of these other administrations, Republican, Democrat, or Hottentot. It doesn't make any difference. It identifies with the American dream as it spans the years and as it belongs to the divine brotherhood of God over men. Because God has been enthroned in this country. You'll find it on your coins. That's the basis for freedom. That's the struggle for freedom. In God we trust. Now, no one can deny that we have had a history of tyranny and infamy in our own country. We all recognize that great injustices have been done uh, from the time that slavery was first instituted in our country. We realize that. But this generation cannot right all the wrongs that were done in all previous generations. It can only right a few of them. And we hope that it will right as many of these wrongs as possible. But I feel that if we are to go ahead and have a revolution in this country that would destroy us by pitting the colored race against the white race, the white race against the colored race, and all races against one another, 
it would be a most unfortunate happening to break the American dream that way because I believe that we have many examples and these examples are before us in the press almost daily of men and women who are fine Negro Americans that have won their freedom in this country financially and independently of any assistance from outside sources. They've gone to universities, they've made a name for themselves, and they've uh, become achievers in the world. Well, if they can do it, and certainly a lot of white people are doing it, and the colored people can do it, then you see freedom is won by merit. And I don't believe that all of the colored people in this country approve of the things that have happened in this country that are shattering the American dream. I believe that the colored people of this land, many of them, are 100% loyal Americans. I don't believe that they approve of any of these things that have been happening. So we cannot judge a race by its color. We cannot judge a man by his skin or by his religion and, or his nationality in any respect. We can only judge people by their acts, by what they do, by what manifests in their world, what is acting there. And what should act there is the true patriotism that our forefathers had. Why, the women were very much a part of it. Do you think that those Quaker girls that walked along with their long skirts on in contradistinction to our modern girls with, with their dresses up over their knees, do you think that those Quaker girls that probably loaded the powder for their husbands' muskets when they went to church were bad women? Do you think they were warmongers? Do you think they wanted war and struggle, and that they hated the Indians? I don't think so. I think they were interested in the American dream. They wanted to build a land here and carve it out of the wilderness. They wanted opportunity for their children to grow up and to be religious people and God-fearing people. And to people this land with a glorious group of people that loved the opportunity that heaven afforded them. They wanted that. They believed in it. They fought for it. They lived for it. They died for it. But today that is forgotten. And in the jungle rhythms of our modern asphalt society, we have an entirely different thought pattern. We have the cult now that was raised during the Roosevelt years. We were brought up on three and two-tenths percent beer and everything that goes with it, having their hand out to society and saying, feed me, brother, can you spare a dime? Well, I still believe that the answer to it all is on our coins, in God we trust. But I believe that we have to set the example somewhere along the line and show that it can be done. It's not a matter of the cult of achievement for achievement's sake alone, like a couple of little boys running in a sack race. It's not that. It's the idea of recognizing that we have something that we are standing for. And what we have under God Almighty is the greatest gift that this land or any other land has ever had. It's the opportunity to keep our freedom. You see, freedom in each generation is something that we can lose. We have to win it all over again. I think one of the problems of America that has shattered our American dream is the fact that the young people today feel that it isn't worth fighting for. There's no struggle anymore. Everything comes easy. You just turn on a button. You open a can of beans. You get your fish out of cans. You don't go down to the seashore and fish your own fish. It comes out of cans if you want fish. Whatever you want, you just turn a button. Snap a little switch on a set and you have a picture. Pick up a telephone and order it. Get a mail order rifle and shoot a president. Do anything you want to do. That's the way it is today. Well, you surely don't believe that's right, and I don't either. And therefore, I think we are going to have to recognize as lovers of freedom that we are going to have to do something about this. Now, I don't think you should get out on a soapbox, and I don't propose to get out on a soapbox either. But I do think we're going to have to change our thinking a bit and recognize that we do have a sphere of influence, you and I. Every one of us have a sphere of influence. There are people that you meet that you can influence, that you can help and work with. People today are not interested in politics. 
They're not concerned about religion. They say, don't talk about religion, don't talk about politics. Master Mori said, I say, let's talk about them. Because what does religion and politics concern? Religion and politics concerns man. Religion and politics concerns you and I. Religion and politics concerns your children and our future. And when you stop to consider that you may become your own grandpa, <laughs> yes, it's true, you can be your own grandpa. When you stop to consider that, you do have a stake in this, every one of you and every human being on earth. Now, you aren't going to be able to convince the average Christian, red-blooded American that re-embodiment is correct just because you believe it, and you don't have to change his opinion on re-embodiment, but you certainly can inculcate into people that you meet the fact that the golden rule is true, that you believe that everything that people have that happens to them comes to them for some reason. Nothing happens by chance. Some people say, my goodness, I've had so much trouble in my life, life isn't worth living. Other people say, well, I've never had a bit of trouble in my life. Everything just runs smooth for me from the time I was born. And I've heard both sides of the story. My barber told me one time, he says, I've never been sick a day in my life. I said, you've never been sick a day in your life? He said, never, very proudly. <clears throat> well, I said, that's a marvelous record. The next day, he came down with Parkinson's disease or something similar. He never knew another well day afterward. Just like that, bang. So it goes to show you that you never know what a day can bring forth. And therefore, we have to tie ourselves to the past by recognizing that we are also a part of the future. We have to realize that the American dream is ours from the beginning to the present and in the future. And I don't care if you're embodied in Greece or Turkey or China or Japan or where you are or in the Fiji Islands. The principles that involve the American dream are a part of the divine plan for man. It's embodied in the very statement, I am race, America. America, A-M-E-R-I-C-A. -E and if you take that word apart, it reads, I am race. And it means, of course, the race of people that identify with their own God presence. And that's the plan for the whole earth. God doesn't exclude anybody. It was Edwin Markham in his poem, The Whole where he said he drew a circle and shut me out. I drew a circle and took him in, or something to that effect. Maybe I've got it reversed, but it doesn't make any difference. You can use it either way. Because the idea is you can't shut God out of your life. You may want to shut him out because you don't have enough faith yet to believe in him. But what about that statement Jesus made where he said if you have the faith of a grain of mustard seed, the size of a grain of mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be removed, it'll be removed. Some people don't believe that. I had uh, some people doubt the power of precipitation in the alchemy books. But I want you to know that after the alchemy book was printed and I was in Los Angeles, I had any number of people come up to me and tell me that they had either precipitated a amethyst cross directly in their hands or one was precipitated by spiritual vision and it later manifested and they got it. How many people in this audience did precipitate an amethyst cross? Will you please put up your hands? There's one. Is there any other person? Well, several people came up to me in Los Angeles and told me about it. At least we got one in this audience, and I've heard of other cases. Well, it doesn't make any difference whether they did or whether they didn't because a lot of our people that have read the alchemy course have been able to attract to themselves through the power of, of vision some things in their world that they've wanted for a long time and they were then able to develop and get. How many people have had successful results in precipitating anything? Put up your hands. Well, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen people in here that have had results in precipitating. And that's too goodly a number to have happened by chance, isn't it? And I do, I do say this to anyone that has tried to precipitate and has failed. 
that nothing is ever lost as far as energy goes. And if you have used your energy constructively to try to envision good things for yourself and others, you have started a foundation work and ultimately, sometime, someplace, somewhere, it will manifest if you keep on about your father's business. I believe that, and I know that to be true. Of course, a lot of us look through very small apertures upon the world. We see a little slit of so many years, and we say that is life. Life is not just looking through horse blinders. Life is taking off the blinders and seeing the whole time stream and recognizing how that the law of cause and effect works. And the law of cause and effect works as far as America is concerned. I think what has happened today then is that this country is being stripped by spoilers of her great opportunities. I do not believe that many of these changes that we are experiencing are good and valid changes. I think they are most unfortunate for all of us. And I think that if we aren't careful, we are going to see everything lost and go down the drain. Now, I don't believe that is going to happen, but I believe it could happen. And I don't think we have any time to spare at all. I believe that the American dream has got to be preserved by men of the nature of Paul Revere, by men of the nature of Samuel Adams, and by men like Tom Paine, people who understand the meaning of sacrifice. General Marquis de Lafayette, who came over to help this nation in his youth. All of those men, and many that I have not named, and many unnamed patriots and heroes, lived today on this planet, in other bodies, some in other lands and some here, people who identified with the American Revolution. So the American ideal is a great ideal. It isn't just our dream. It's a dream that God has for the world of the equality and brotherhood of man whereby people get what they deserve and work for it. I trust that you will see from what I have given you this evening a little bit more of the meaning of freedom. I trust that you will identify with it a little bit more. I think that because people do not believe in re-embodiment, they lose an awful lot because they don't see their involvement personally. They seem to think that they inherited something a few years ago. They were born in this land. They could have been born in Germany under the Kaiser or under Hitler. They could have been anywhere. They happened to be here. I think we should give thanks every day for having been born here. But how would it be in the world today if no America existed, if America was dead? What about your children and your grandchildren and your children's children? Where would they be born? in some stark place in the world where they never had a chance to breathe the name of God, where the holy name of mother meant nothing, but a mother was nothing more than an incubator for a batch of baby chicks that society could seize and put out into communes. Is that the way of, of God? I can think of no worse hell than this nation, this globe, this whole vast sphere rolling through space with communes all over the world and everybody working for some monolithic monster where the, as in George Orwell's 1984, everybody would be policed by the thought police and devices would be developed that could read our minds and we would all be subjected to the most intense pressures of conformity. What a terrible and frightful nightmare that would be. And yet in its place, we have under God the opportunity of keeping this nation great, of making it strong, of rallying to the cause of freedom and understanding what God has given to us in this nation that is the cradle of liberty, not only for our people,
but for all freedom-loving people upon this earth. God bless you and thank you.